Before we start the show, I'd like to summarize 2020. Last year was a challenge and kind of overwhelming. From the pandemic, demonstrations against racial injustice, the election, and now this year, riots at the Capitol. So many of us experience loneliness, anxiety, fear, and sometimes all at once. Our team at the Minneapolis Foundation not only will continue to bring you stories to inspire you, bring you hope, and keep you going, but we also want to remind you that you're not alone. Our host, Shonda Smith-Baker, has impacted me personally, and I just helped produce the podcast. She continues to impact hundreds and thousands of people listening, and now has become the Chief Impact Officer and Senior Vice President at the Minneapolis Foundation. In 2020, we produced 21 total episodes reaching nine countries, and we did that last year alone. On top of that, Conversations with Shonda podcast has become an award-winning podcast, receiving the Sabre Award Recognition for a superior achievement in branding, reputation, and engagement. Please help me congratulate Shonda for her achievements in 2020. And thank you to everyone at the Minneapolis Foundation and to our podcast team, Darlin Benjamin and Sarah Gilland, for your resilient work. It's been such an honor to work with you. And it's not over. The impact will continue, and we will bring you fresh episodes and help elevate critical issues. On behalf of the Minneapolis Foundation, we wish you joy, peace, and healing in the year 2021. So you are the first guest of 2021, a new year that feels like an old year. And I'm just delighted to have you. And I would just love it if you would introduce yourself to our audience. I'll just start by saying I saw a meme that was super funny recently where someone was like, hey, this is 2021, handed their beer to 2020, like, let me do my work. So, um, yeah, we are we are in 2021. I'm honored to be the first guest of 2021. Um, I'm Isaiah Oliver, President and CEO of the Community Foundation of Greater Flint, where I describe my work as leading an organization focused on engaging people in the world of philanthropy. Um, in community philanthropy, we're talking about time, talent, and treasure, the trifecta, um, and using that to make our community a better place to live in, work in, and contribute to. As a geographic-based community foundation, we manage a significant amount of assets in the Genesee County community, where the heart of Genesee County is Flint, Michigan, and I have the opportunity to do a number of things, include including pulling on levers um, beyond just grant making to make community a better place. And so hopefully we get the opportunity to talk about many of those things, we'll maybe talk a bit about Flint and its history and its more recent history regarding our water crisis and water crisis related issues, social justice, racial justice, um, environmental justice. Um, but I think we'd be remiss if we didn't take a moment to talk about the impacts of um, the la this last week and what that's meant and how it's going to impact philanthropy. So I'm excited to be here, looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, right on. I'm really uh, thrilled to have you here. And um, I wanna get into all those topics and hopefully we, we can uh, touch on them enough for people to be really um, uh, curious, inspired, um, challenged, um, and have an opportunity to, to think differently about, about the issues that we're faced with every day in our work um, and in our lives and in our communities. Before we go um, into that, though, there are uh, folks that are not super clear on what a community foundation is. And I'm curious on if you have a way of describing um, what a community foundation is or how a community foundation might be different than a private foundation. And so, again, I'll go back to what I said a minute ago. We, we, we specialize in the trifecta, time, talent, and treasure. Um, and then we use those tools actually to make community a better place. And so we engage people in the world of land, really making community a better place by giving of yourself. And so we're not a single donor that's left a significant amount of money, amount of money to make community better and endow those resources over the long haul. Um, we are a collection of, in the, in the Community Foundation of Greater Flint space, we're a collection of over 30,000 donors. And we have over 550 unique funds and we braid those funds and the relationship tied to them to make community a better place, allowing people the opportunity to give, again, 440 volunteers, their time and talent, 22 staff members that are spread across Genesee County and have a different perspective of what the community is, how it got there, the lived history, the racial history of that community, 
and contribute their time and talent to make it a better place. And then we also have significant resources and we bridge the relationship between the folks who have resources and those who are marginalized the most in our community to in fact, make it a better place. And so it's an amazing space. Um, I don't wanna compare community foundations to private foundations, but I am in love with the model of community foundations, what they mean, um, while also completely exploring um, the history of community foundations and how we've moved from being trust built, right? The transactional work of getting grants out to really having a ton of social capital and other levers that we can pull on to make community a better place. And so uh, again, excited about the work, excited about the field and um, probably more excited about the potential of the community foundation field to actually um, the ready-made infrastructure that community foundations are to really effectuate change. Can we talk about this week? <laughs> we certainly should. I don't even know if I have words or for a question, but you know, I'm sitting in my office right now and I have a television uh, to the left of me on the wall. And um, I had it, you know, on low volume and I seen them come in, uh, the security come in to grab pence. So it wasn't loud enough for me to be really attentive, but it was visual enough for me to know that something had occurred. And I spent the rest of the day wrestling between this is unbelievable and completely predictable, right? And thinking about the images that we had in Minneapolis with peaceful protesters, or even Warnick, where he uh, was on the floor of the Capitol building with other faith leaders being um, pulled away, I think it was in 2017, and, 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 and talked to when the security measures that we're taking in that case comparatively to what we're seeing. And I don't feel completely processed, but I, I'm wondering what your reaction has been to the events of this week. Oh my, so so I am not completely processed yet, um, but I will tell you there have been a number of um, pushes to make a statement of some sort, internal statement, external statement. Um, and, and I will tell you my feelings are mixed. I am not, uh, the unbelievable part of your statement, I'm not sure that I'm there yet. I think it was completely believable, believable to me. And, um, and I'm not saying that I expected it, I think, but I think it's in a, been a build, not only a build over the last four years, but quite frankly, maybe a build over the last 50 years. And it could very easily be a build over the last 400 years. And so uh, I, I, <laughs> um, I, was, I was much like you, I was working during the day and I would hear tidbits about it. I mean, I'm in Zoom meetings as all of us are. And so every now and then someone will say, are you watching what's happening? And I, for me, at the point where I started to hear more of the details around what's happening, I didn't want to check out because I was still on a high, this high that um, if we do the right things, if we, if we rock the boat, if we engage in the democratic process as a people, as a group of marginalized people, as black people, if we start to engage in the process, then we'll start to yield results that align with our core values. And so I was still on the high of Georgia. I was still on the high of democracy prevailing and I didn't want to give that up. I didn't want to jump off of my call and watch what I knew or I heard was playing out on national TV as a rebellion against that democratic process. Um, voters who were traditionally marginalized living in here, areas with high concentrations of poverty prevailing in the democratic system. I didn't want to look at what the response was to that by the majority. Um, when I finally looked at it, I struggled. I struggled quite a bit as a, an African-American leader of a historically white institution, what my statement should be and what the goal of that statement might be. Was I trying to convince people that, that we weren't like that? Um, was I trying to make people feel comfortable, create a compassionate space for people to engage with the community foundation? Was I trying to cover the fact that we maybe haven't done the appropriate work to prepare our community to actually wrestle with the tough issues? Um, and I struggled quite a bit. And I will say that, again, still unresolved on what the statement might be. I didn't make a statement when people stormed the Michigan State Capitol. Um, I didn't make a statement when I did. We did make a statement regarding George Floyd, but we didn't make a statement when there were issues in Portland and when there were issues in Minneapolis. And so I was like, OK, am I making a statement because as a leader, you have to say something? And quite frankly, um, my approach to the work is when things get tough, you turn to wonder, but then that wonder somehow mobilizes you to do something, not to say something. And I think far too many leaders say stuff 
I'm saying stuff because I'm not sure what words are appropriate here, but uh, far too many leaders say stuff, but they don't do the work. And I didn't want to get mixed in with that group of leaders that was saying stuff, but not doing stuff. And so I haven't um, released the statement just yet, but I'll tell you the last couple of days have been an up and down and quite frankly, a reflection of who I am as an African-American male. This is our journey. You get the highs and then you get the lows. You start to feel like you're breaking through the glass ceiling and then you're reminded that it's not glass at all, right? It's a concrete ceiling and you're not going anywhere. And so you go in and you get excited about Georgia and then here comes another thing that kind of pushes you back into reality. And I would say, um, before I close out here, I, I struggle more with the inequity at play in the responses. And I'll probably struggle even more when I watch the slaps on the wrist that will happen to those that perpetrated these acts. Um, That was more of a struggle to me than the attack on democracy. This was an attack, less an attack on democracy, but a show of all of the systemic inequities that we have been describing for, again, not the last four years, not the uh, 50 years, but quite frankly, the last 400 years. Yeah. And so, yeah. What felt unbelievable to me was not so much that um, there were people that were willing to do it. What felt unbelievable to me is that they were able to do it, right? Like when you think about just national security, I think about that, that space, that city, the Capitol building, the White House are two of the most protected buildings in our country. For that to happen there um, really heightened um, for me the degree of complicitness that has been happening um, within our systems, right? So we do know that has happened over 400 years and we know how that has played out and we know what it's resulted in more or less, right? I don't think that we have fully as a country, as a community embodied all of what those complicit actions have led us into Mm -hmm. and would have allowed for. But the idea that they can storm in that way, right? And I remember thinking and even saying, and I've seen other people say it, um, you know, folks were mad about folks, you know, looting Target, like they're looting in the White House. And I'm like, they got the nerve to talk about us. They're looting in the White House. I mean, for goodness sake. But I guess our day to day lives have made us. Um, I've developed a callus around those things. And so that's the reason why I described it as, as believable, because I'm, I'm watching on TV. I'm not watching with popcorn, but sometimes in laughter as I watch um, my my the majority kind of engage with police. And I think the same thing that we thought watching them in the White House, right? It's like, I dare you talk to a police officer like that. And I've accepted that my lived experience is gonna be very different than others. And yeah. so when I watch folks loot the White House, or quite frankly, I mean, the, the Capitol, but more, more, more frankly, watch a person walk through the halls of the Capitol with a Viking hat on and no shirt. Um, the audacity to do that is one thing, but whether or not I thought it was believable, it's like, man, I didn't think it was. I mean, a, for a long time growing up in this country it was like, man, I can't believe this person's talking to the police like that. And I had to realize that maybe things are just different. And I think this is putting on for the world to see that things are different. There's no arguing whether or not we treat people different based off of their skin, skin tone, based off of their culture, based off of where they come from, based off of their history in this country. That was that's on full display right now. And I would say as much as I want to believe is not arguable, I'd bet in the next couple of weeks we find a way to make um, some of this stuff palatable. Absolutely. And I think, you know, what I found interesting is that, you know, the things that we often think as uh, people of color, black folks that we would be saying in our living room are now being said out loud on television, which which brings me some hope right, of saying Black Lives Matters protesters would not have been treated that way, or the Black community or folks of color barging would not have been treated that way, which was an interesting sort of comparison that I don't know if we would have seen a couple of years ago. And as Van Jones said, it was, you know, it was a, um, an undeniable statement about race in this country. And, um, you know, we keep encountering these undeniable examples. And I'm curious on um, and actually, before I go to what I'm curious about, let's talk about the statement making, because I, I appreciate the fact that you've been very thoughtful about what what kind of statements should I make and when do you make them and what for what purpose and for what audience. And, you know, are do you think that making statements at this point is performative? 
I think it is depending on the person. Unfortunately, we all get mixed in. And so I think some people are very genuine in their statements. Um, some folks are sincerely ignorant about what's happening in the country, but they have feel like they have a responsibility to make a statement. Other folks are just pressure, peer pressure into making a statement. Um, some folks don't know who they are as a leader, so this is what leaders do. Um, and this is no indictment of anyone who's made a statement, who's con contemplating whether or not a statement is appropriate or have decided that they're not going to make one. I just want everyone to feel comfortable that when you make a statement, that action has to follow. You have to align the mission and the vision and quite frankly, the values of the organization behind whatever it is you put out there. Because right now people re are reserving the right to question everything. Um, we learned that through the water crisis in Flint. We're learning that through this racial reckoning right now. We're, we're experiencing that through this global health pandemic. People are saying, give me all of the information that way I can make the best informed decision for me and my family. And I think we're doing that with every statement that's coming out. And so if nothing more, I'm asking people to be cautious about what they say out loud to the public because the public isn't just taking it because you say it anymore. They're asking you to do something. At some point, you should be mobilized by your words to do something in many cases because systemic racism exists in many of the organizations that are making statements. They're asking you to do something different than you've done in the past. Yeah, yeah. And there's companies making statements and then still giving significant dollars to PACs, right? That support. So the, the, the hypocritical nature of the actions I think are being called and people are paying attention to that. Um, when have you thought at all about, um, you know, we're seeing people on social media doing incredibly harmful things, um, the action, the woman that got arrested for jumping on the young man for the cell phone is now facing these legal consequence. And then we had, I don't know how many people at the Capitol this week. Have you thought at all about what does that mean in terms of personnel policy and whether or not uh, and maybe you have personnel policies that address that if anyone is is making um, biased statements, racial um, statements or abusive statements or behaviors um, within uh, their personal time, how that might impact your employees. Have you thought about that? We haven't had a whole lot of um, uh, a conversation about that. And it's actually something that we should probably be taking back as we're we're exploring our policies, our values, again, as an institution, um, as we continue to evolve and grow, right? The country is, I mean, quite frankly, I'm thankful to grandchildren. Um, it's social media and grandchildren that are coming home and asking their parents, their grandparents, those tough questions that they were able to not or not respond to. Now that stuff is on the kitchen table and you have to respond to it. You have to be thoughtful about it. You have to explain not only your actions, but your intentions to the folks that you love. Um, and so I would say all of those biased behaviors or many of those biased behaviors are um, under scrutiny right now by the folks that you care about. And so I appreciate that. And I think it's, it is pushing us as institutions to be thoughtful about policies that align with those things we believe in. Um, we have not wrestled specifically with that, but we are thoughtful about equity and more specifically race equity in the work. So how are we ensuring that we create a work environment that allows every individual to learn and grow and prosper and thrive in the role that they've been hired for. And in many cases, we gotta be thoughtful about what it means to create an environment that protects people from the bigotry that exists outside of our walls. And so, or quite frankly, we're virtual right now. So that exists um, in the workspaces that we've created. So I appreciate you lifting that. And that's something we are spending time with, but we need to spend more on. Talk to me about sort of your leadership trajectory um, into your role now. And um, I can't remember the quite the timing of it, but I feel like the Flint water crisis was right about the time you you came in or right before. Can you just share a little bit about that context? Oh, yeah, I always start by saying Flint, Michigan, born and raised on the playground is where I spend most of my days. Um, <laughs> I love it. I'm a Flint kid, born and raised. Um, I, I've lived in this community all of my life. Um, I was very engaged, um, both politically and then from a community perspective. And in 2014, uh, we were we had just launched a new strategic plan focused on doubling down on community leadership, including pulling on all of those levers beyond grant making to make community a better place. At that point, we were 20 something odd years old. We had built some community dollars and community endowment. Um, we had some trust when we called people, they answered. When we called meetings, people showed up. We brought the cookies. They brought the information. And we started to develop a relationship with community where beyond just dollars that we gave out, we were able to make a difference. 
Um, one thing that we relied on was really our strong community connections and understanding community in authentic ways. Um, and an ability to amplify resident voices because we were, I mean, you've heard it before, power and proximity, but we weren't proximate enough to amplify those voices. And I was put on to the Community Foundation team as Vice President of Community Impact for that purpose. Um, my predecessor um, was very thoughtful about what she brought to the organization and what gaps existed. And one of those gaps was really authentic connections in the Flint community specific. Again, we serve all of Genesee County, but Flint was 100,000 of the 415,000 populace. And so, um, and if we think about equity in our work, whether it's literacy or access to healthy food or Flint Women and Girls initiatives, um, our focus was on those marginalized the most, which was Flint, Michigan, and that's where we had some gaps in, in connections. Um, so I was brought on with no philanthropic experience. I understood community. I love community. I was of community, but I knew very little about how to make a grant. Um, I, I had some, some experience in writing grants, and I had some relationships in this space as a result of writing grants, but that wasn't my expertise. My expertise was connections. And I came on and I was, I was focused on learning or understanding philanthropy um, as opposed to have, coming in with philanthropic experience. Um, and soon after I came in in summer of 14, we started to work on literacy and really doubling down on that community leadership capacity that was necessary doing the professional development to get me connected, all of the boot camps that you go through with COF or CMF. And I'm using all of these different, but yeah. um, so I'm going through all of that process. And then late 2015, um, we start hearing our residents talk about the impact of, of water and water quality. And quite frankly, a number of leaders, community leaders, and I will say, including myself, did not give it the attention that it deserved. And this is me taking some, some responsibility for even my actions as a leader in community. It's like, okay, I hear it, um, but maybe that's just a water main break, or maybe that's just a switch, or maybe that's just a, a mild byproduct, right? And so we would make excuses for these residents who had voices, but those voices weren't listened to or weren't amplified. Because all too often we say, we're gonna give residents voices. No, they have voices, we just don't listen or ignore, or oftentimes um, put them in a box and don't respond. So the voices were lifted, but we weren't listening. And so um, we really got engaged in the work in early 2016 after Dr. Monahan and Atisha really lifted the veil on it, started to show real data. The scientists started to, to validate the points and claims of the residents and people started to fall in. And we started to push against state government in the reporting that they were doing as compared to reports that were coming from the scientists. And our work doubled down because at that point we thought we had relationships that were developing with community. And we were reminded that folks who have reserved the right to question everything were questioning everything, not just state government, not just federal government. They were, they were, they were questioning $250 million endowments that were held in downtown Flint that may not have reflected the community that it served. They were questioning two or $3 billion private foundations that had done work, great work over 90 years. They were questioning whether or not they were there for the people and rightfully so. And it really, it didn't only change the way we engaged in the work, but it really made us change the way we showed up to the work. And so um, we were, I mean, obviously completely changed forever. We really started to double down on equity. We really started to think um, critically about what, what role race and race equity played in the water crisis and quite frankly, crisis and post-traumatic kind of issues that happen in communities. And, um, we are a new organization, not only because of my leadership. I became president um, just, just under four years ago now. Um, I was at the Community Foundation for two and a half years when I applied for the role of president. And um, I've been in the philanthropic space for just under seven years. It feels like 21 years. And to be honest, Shonda, I didn't think I would make it this long. Um, oh, uh, like it was quite the on. radical. Yeah, we've okay. had that conversation. I didn't think I would make it this long. Um, but I'm happy to be in this field, in this space. I wake up every day and go to sleep every night thinking about how to make my community a better place. And I get to go to work, quite frankly, in my basement these days um, with the tools and staff and the volunteer capacity and the board support to actually do something positive. And so um, I'm thankful for the opportunity, but yeah, my road into this space and I don't know what my future is in this space, but I'm hoping it's great. Yeah, man, so we're both hometown uh, folks you know, moving into uh, roles and positions and having a responsibility for making a difference where um, we have been raised, where we have been nurtured, where we 
have uh, friends, families, others, maybe even personally have experienced some of the same issues that we're trying to solve for. And, um, you know, I can't think of anything that's more proximate. There's there's days where I think, you know, people come and they question uh, the organization, our foundation, like, are we proximate enough? And I'm like, <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, man, you don't know how proximate I feel to the work and, and needing to separate out, you know, my lived experience, my professional experience from an institution that's been here for a long time. And, um, when I came into philanthropy formally, it was not long after you became um, the president at, at the Flint Community um, Foundation and uh, in 2017, at the end of 2017. And I remember my first six months, I was just kind of like eyes wide open and, and thinking, I wonder if I could make it in this work. Like what, could, what did you confront the most, like personally or professionally? Um. One, we were a very process-driven organization, and and we had been, I mean, our primary focus was raising community endowment. And so there was this assumption that the more money we had, the better impact we would have on community. And quite frankly, in our community, and I don't know if it's true for the Minneapolis Foundation, but we will, we will likely never be the largest grant maker in our community. So there has to be more that you're going to do beyond just giving dollars away. And there has to be more expected of you than just giving dollars away. But that was our work. And my predecessor had made a decision to pivot, a pivot beyond. I mean, she realized that when we're talking about tackling issues of poverty, we're talking about tackling issues of illiteracy. Um, it's going to require more than just the community foundation's philanthropic resources to make those changes. But she also recognized that, hey, I don't have all of the tools to do that. And so how do I bring more folks on? Um, and so the major change for me was working with her to, one of my, one of my uh, mentors would say, leadership is the art of disappointing people at a rate they can absorb. Oh, well, there you go. So how do we turn this ship just enough that we're challenging folks to be different, but not so much that they jump off of it. And so that was, that was probably my greatest challenge because my pace, and my intensity, and I, I, I've, I've grown and watched you grow is probably similar to yours. I want to go, and I want to go at 90 miles an hour to start. And if we can get faster than that, let's keep moving. And everyone isn't ready to move at that pace. And that was probably the, the struggle for me. It's like, you said this is where we're going. I see an opening here. I got a linebacker that blocked and opened up the hole. Let's get through it. And it's like, nah, wait just a minute, we got to make it wider because more people have to get through the hole than just you. And so that was probably my greatest challenge in the first three, four years of the work is just really figuring out a pace that worked both for me personally and for the organization that I was trying to move. And quite frankly, in this work and the, the field that we're trying to move, this whole, the whole field of philanthropy is wrestling with how it moves forward and at what pace we can move and figuring out a pace that works for more people. That way we can go further together for the long haul and sustain it is is probably the challenge the thing that i wrestle with every night is like why don't we just do this shit oh, see that i knew that was going to happen why don't we just do it right yeah and and it's like we don't just do it because we don't have a critical mass to sustain it and so we've got to do work on making sure we have critical mass to sustain all of these interventions that we're funding all of these things that we're popping up and that for me has been a journey yeah, for sure. And, and when I think about community who is expecting and demanding more and our activists that are out there really challenging in, in smart ways and um, being very deliberate about how they are elevating and raising the issues um, in our institutions and in our country and in, our, in, in terms of justice and so on. And then you have us that are systems players that recognize like, you know, basically, yo, we want to work at the same pace, uh, but we cannot because we have an institution, we have boards, we have people, we have teams, we have processes, we have, you know, sometimes, well, we always have sort of institutional um, kind of boundaries that we operate within. And, you know, have you, because I know I have personally wrestled with that as well in terms of the pace or how do you manage the expectation of, of community when um, you do have, a, you know, we do run at a, at, at a quick pace, but we do have to be able to manage that 
relative to our roles. So do you do you feel that tension or how have you managed that? And I'm holding those two tensions all the time, right? The 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 need for the work to happen today and the patience to have it work at a pace that works for everyone or for more. Um, uh, it's it's a it's one of my leadership challenges. It's a, one of my one of my goals for 2021 is to over communicate. Um, to say and, and one of my staff members would say to say all of the words. Isaiah, you got a lot of stuff going in your head. You've got a lot of lived experiences. You've got a lot of ambitions. Um, you got to say it all because you're moving so fast at times that you're not taking everyone with you, or you're not allowing them to figure out what their role is on this journey. And um, and you can't change the world alone. I have an amazing team at the Community Foundation of Creative Flight. And I have to be sure as leader, and this again is why it's part of my leadership journey and maybe even some leadership challenges. I have to figure out how to get them what they need to provide their best to solving the problems that exist in our community. And so am I slowing down enough to empower others to live into their best selves? Um, I am hardwired. Um, logic driven pragmatists, do what works, continue to push. I would tell folks that I'm also not as creative as people think I am. I was just like, eh, I'm not that creative. I'm just the first black dude to ever be in this role. And so I see the world different than any of my predecessors. That doesn't mean I'm creative. That just means that you've never seen this shit before. Um, and so really pushing at folks to understand who I am and what I'm bringing and understanding my own gaps. That way I'm slowing down enough to feel those appropriately. That way, as a leader, I'm actually showing up as my best self and I'm also allowing space for other people to do the same. Yeah, the other the other piece of, of your career journey that mirrors mine is that when I came into uh, a role in my previous organization, Pillsbury United Communities, and I was hired, they were looking for someone that had um, some experiences and a, a bachelor's degree I didn't really, I mean, I had experience, but it wasn't formal. I did not have a degree and um, they took a bit of a chance on me. And you came in without the formal background and moved into a VP role, if I understand it. And I'm watching people looking at how do they create more inclusive um, staffing and approaches to their work but perhaps unwilling to get rid of the idea of who they think are qualified and who who's qualified and who's not. Is that not inequity at play though, right? Is that not systemic inequity right there? Um, I'm only, I, I put all of these barriers in place to someone getting in the role. And then I'm questioning why the field is predominantly white women. Well, and I'm questioning why of this large group of white women that are in the field, why only or mostly white males get the CEO role, right? Just if you're if you're asking these questions, what are you what are you feeding the system to yield the result that you're getting? And I quite frankly, it is in many cases the hiring process. What are we looking for? Very rarely does a person say, you know what, I need a VP of philanthropic services or a VP of development, but I don't need a person who's raised money before. Right. I'm looking for a VP of community impact or grant making and community leadership, but I don't need a person who's never made grants before. So what are we really looking for? What are we looking to change in community and how are we outlining our, our hiring processes to get us to that end as opposed to what we believe? And I think it, 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 it requires that we trust that our understanding of the systems, our understanding of the role might not be the only understanding of the role and be thoughtful about what we're trying to get out on the other end. We're trying to get a person who understands community and we trust that they can learn philanthropy. Sometimes we play this up that like philanthropy is the hardest thing in the world to learn. And so you got to come in with philanthropic experience to operate in this space. The greatest blessing that I've had in this space was probably not understanding philanthropy and having the opportunity to learn it as it was transitioning from the trust model or the development model to the community leadership model. And the other blessing that I probably had in this space is that I never had to assimilate to the associate program officer, program officer, program manager, program director roles, where I was able to sit in a system, not be able to influence the decision making, where when I finally got to a VP or a presidential or executive role, um, people didn't see 10, 15 years of me assimilating to what philanthropy was during that time. And so no one's calling me out like, ah, you sat here for 10, 15 years and watched this happen. And now all of a sudden, 
Uh, you want to write a statement about Black Lives Matter? Yeah. Did you care before that? I don't have that burden because I was never in leadership before. I came right into leadership. Um, and so those are probably blessings. And we have to figure out how we ensure that folks, if my ceiling should be the next person's floor, how do I ensure they don't have to go through that same experience in order to, to have to, to demonstrate leadership in the ways that it should be demonstrated in 2021 in philanthropy? Right. Let's talk about the other levers that you use. And I often say, I did not come to the Minneapolis Foundation to do grant making only. Um, you know, I came uh, to, to, to lend leadership, to lean a perspective, to change the way that things work, to offer, to offer my, my perspective and talents. Um, that's me personally. But when I look at all the other things that we're able to do, it's quite exciting. And so I'm interested to hear you know, how you think about other levers that you can use um, to move change in your community. Oh, man. So, so I'm going to give a quick story. I'm an 80s baby, grew up in the 90s. And so, you know, Atari, Nintendo, Sega Genesis, that, that's my world, right? And so I use this um, Sonic the Hedgehog analogy to kind of describe the way that we do our work um, or the way that I lead in our work. And so if you know the game Sonic the Hedgehog, do you know the game Sonic the Hedgehog? Okay, so in Sonic the Hedgehog, you go around collecting rings, right? You collect these rings throughout the game, and you go through multiple levels, and then ultimately the goal is to stay alive until the end of the game, right? And then to conquer the last level. Oversimplified, but that's the goal of the game. Along the way, you collect these rings, and these rings allow you to do certain things, like run into spikes and not die. Um, and so you go around, you collect these rings, and when, when you run into a spike, you lose some rings, but you don't die, but then you collect some more rings and you run into a spike and you don't die, but you don't die because you've collected these rings or this social capital. And so what I feel like I've had the opportunity to do and I've been able to leverage because the Community Foundation has been doing it for the last 32 years, I'm only 39 years old, but I've been able to collect my own personal social capital. Um, I was on the school board, I was on the hospital board, I was, I mean, I mean, I've been able to collect social capital in my community, disconnected from the work at the Community Foundation. But the Community Foundation, again, has a significant amount of assets and 22 staff members that also have been collecting social capital across community. So beyond just our grant making or our financial capital that we get to bring to the table, we bring some social capital to the table. And so when there's a question about whether or not race should or should not be included in a conversation, with the president of the chamber or the mayor of the city or the president of the hospital. I can go into those conversations armed with some social capital to spend that when I say, listen, you, we got to talk about race. And if we don't talk about race, it's a complete miss. And I'm not going to continue to come to these meetings if we're not going to center race in the discussion. I spend a little bit of social capital in those conversations, but I allow that conversation to continue with me there. And I can say I'm not coming and people aren't going to not invite the president of the community foundation to most of these meetings. You, you know this world. So I'm spending social capital to continue conversations. That didn't cost us money. That wasn't grant making. That wasn't development. That was really spending on those things that we've developed over years alongside our financial resources, alongside giving hundreds of millions of dollars away in our community. We're building this capital that we can spend. And I don't die from it, right? I spend some coins, but I don't die. And when I'm able to leverage, now, now we got a mission and vision that I agree with. We got values at the Community Foundation that I agree with. So I'm willing to give my social capital to the Community Foundation and leverage it to make community a better place. And so you start to pulling on all of the lever, all of the levers, all right? You start talking about insisting on racial equity in meetings, in conversation. Um, you start talking about amplifying resident voice. Well, I don't want to hear it. Well, if you don't want to hear resident voice, then I'm not going to be able to show up to these meetings anymore. Or I'm going to insert it whenever I'm around you. And I'm going to spend some coins on that. I'm going to spend some rings, but it's worth it. Or when we start talking about um, authentic resident engagement in our work or um, advancing policy agendas or policy decisions and changing the way systems show up for people beyond just philanthropy. We're spending social capital in those spaces. And those are the levers that we have to pull on but the way that we do it is really by thinking more about um, what we bring to the table than just, you know, grant making and development experience and maybe even the number of people we engage with. Uh, you've said a little bit about uh, the transformation of philanthropy and kind of the future of it. Where do, you, where do you think the future of philanthropy is heading or where do you think it should head? Like, you know, is it heading where it should head? Man, I want us to take some risks. I mean, I really want to see the field um, be the R&D. I mean, I, we found ourselves 
playing in this space and out of necessity, we've been playing in these spaces, filling gaps in state and federal resources that aren't available in our communities. Um, beyond our responsibility to do those things, which is really boxing above our weight class. We're punching above, above our weight class, trying to address issues of poverty. Um, and we have to push for some type of equity in the way that the federal government applies resources to our communities. The state government actually um, deplo deploys resources in our communities. I'd also like to, for us to really move to a place where we are, um, we are being the R&D of community strategy building and engaging with residents and what they want to see happen in the communities that they live in and they serve. Um, that's a space that I think would be amazing, but we also have to balance that with our current reality, that there are many gaps that exist in federal, state and federal resources and state and federal policy decisions that impact resources to come into our community that we also have to leverage. Um, if we could do more things to try out that new, uh, <laughs> there's this idea of chasing squirrels and silver and, uh, and chase like the silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. It's more like a silver buckshot. And how do we allow people to shoot the silver buckshot and figure out how we fund or support with our social capital those things that they're trying out? That would be a, an amazing space to be in. I'm not sure how far we are from being in those spaces, but um, that's the world that I would love to be able to work in. Mm -hmm. What has it been like for you being a young Black male in a country where um, we have been seeing uh, the George Floyds and others um, be uh, murdered without justice and being in a leadership role where people are also looking for responses while you maybe are feeling and wrestling um, with it yourself as a, as a father, as a black male, um, leading, what has that done to you or how have you navigated that over the last year specifically? Because it's been a it's been a rough year. Man, I've been blessed and I don't know if it's it's my mom, which I would definitely give some credit and and who I am and how I show up to. I don't know if it was my predecessor who offered a space for me to bring my 100 percent true self to the office every day. And I've grown comfortable doing that. I don't know if it's the environment that I grew up in, Flint, Michigan, where you are who you are. Um, your social capital is right, right? I mean, your, your, your social circle is right around you, whether it be at the grocery store or your church or whatever. Like I'm so close to my safety net that I can see it, I can feel it. And just before COVID, I, I engage with it often, um, but I'm very comfortable speaking my truth. Um, and I was before I became president of the Community Foundation, I continue to be that now. And so when the George Floyd murder, when it happened, when the murder happened, um, my staff actually helped to draft the, the statement because I didn't want to make a statement about it. I was, I was hurt. I was emotional. Um, I wasn't prepared to represent the organization in that space. I was prepared to represent Isaiah. And I reserve the right to say that I don't have a statement to write, but I think everyone here, a very diverse staff, have perspectives on that. And we should say where the community foundation stands, not where Isaiah stands. Cause you might not even want to hear it to be honest. Cause I think, I, I thought it was complete bullshit. I thought the way we responded to it was terrible. I thought the way our community, I thought we could have done more. I thought we weren't um, thoughtful about the folks who were rioting and why they were doing it. I mean, I just, I had so many feelings that um, all of our stakeholders wouldn't have agreed. Mm -hmm. And I would have maybe received um, responses from board members who trust me and support me as a leader, but may, may not have agreed with my personal perspective. Um, and why go there if I don't have to? No one was telling me I had to make a statement, so I didn't. As an African-American male in this space, I, I find myself very blessed to be comfortable. And I would say the folks who have poured into me over the years have offered me the space to be my 100% true self. And quite frankly, it's the reason why I wasn't sure if I would make it in this field, because I wasn't sure I'd get that kind of support. I wasn't sure that people would allow me to be Isaiah every day when I come into the office and every day when I show up into meetings. Yeah, there's a lot of people that feel like they cannot come in an authentic way um, into places and spaces that they're working. And so do you have, you know, I think you and I both have been uh, nurtured in community and as a result of it and are stick with it in this with it and um, that we have um, good 
uh, communities of support that allow us to continue to grow into our authentic selves. And they will check us if you're, you know, like I will get checked if they think I'm not. And, but I recognize that not everyone has that. And as we have, um, you know, people coming into the work, younger uh, people of color, or people that are just, you know, really wanting to be bolder in their leadership. What what advice do you have about how you structure around that? Man, it's interesting. You got to know your circle. You got to know your support. One, and you have to you have, you have to acknowledge the privilege. I have to acknowledge the privilege. The the earned privilege and the unearned privilege. Privilege right now is one of those those trigger words for people. It's like, what are you saying about me? Because when you say privilege, they're talking white privilege. I think they're earned privileges and unearned, unearned privileges, right? The fact that you finished a four-year degree gave you some privileges. You earned it, but some privileges to operate in spaces that other people cannot. That's okay, right? There's some unearned privileges, like me being male. There are some benefits, whether black or white or Arab American or Chinese. Like As a male, there's some things I can do in spaces that you can't do Shonda and that's not okay. And it's an unearned privilege. And I have to acknowledge that when I come into the space, my ability to be my 100% true self, while I take some hits for being black, I take, I get some privileges by being male and I have to acknowledge that coming into the space. And so um, my power, my, my, my source of en- energy, my battery pack is my wife, my kids, my family, the community that loves me, whether or not I work at the Community Foundation of Greater Flint or if I work at the Kroger on the corner, right? They're going to love me no matter what. And those are the folks that I have to answer to. I have to answer to a board, a 26 member board, I have to answer to a group of stakeholders. I have to answer to a group of donors. But at the same time, they're not the only people that I answer to. I have to answer to the faith community that helped to rear me. I have to answer to the family that continue to support me and protect me from from not only the realities of the world, but quite frankly, from bullies in the hood, right? And so those are folks that I also owe my, my the, the fact that I exist in this space today. And so when I'm only beholding to a group of stakeholders that are connected to white power systems or institutions, then I tend to do things that those folks want me to do on a more consistent basis. But I'm accountable to a whole lot more people than that. And that is a privilege because I can't be... <laughs> I can't be effed over by either side because I'm being held accountable by so many. And so and that's a privilege. And I acknowledge that privilege, but also acknowledge some of the many other unearned privileges that I have in the work that allow me to show up and be my 100 percent true self. Yeah. I mean, that's a word right there. And I think uh, what what I glean. The word. That was a black church. I hear you. I hear you. That's a word. That was a that, word. That, that a, that a preach right there. That's what the sound you said. Hallelujah. Um, because I think, I mean, what what this really boils down to uh, for me and what I, what I heard was really a, a good sense of um, identity, that your identity is not so caught in the role that you have but in the responsibility you have to a community more broadly. And I think when people isolate who they think they're accountable to, their actions get limited and you feel more restricted. Man, and I think a young man in my community, life. young man in my community, I'm going to say his name, his name is Sean Hart. I don't know that he'll ever hear this. Sean has this amazing saying and going into 21, he said, this is the thing to live by. Chase, don't chase the bag, chase the assignment. And so when people see president and CEO, they make the assumption that you made some types of um, trade-offs to get to that space. I'm chasing the assignment. My community deserves better than it's ever had before. I'm able to stand on the shoulders of folks that have already started to pay, pay the way. But the reality is I'm chasing an assignment to make my community a better place. And the Community Foundation of Greater Flint offers significant amount of social capital that I can leverage to make community better place. I knew about Flint before I knew about the Community Foundation. I knew about the gaps in Flint in Genesee County before I knew about the Community Foundation. And this was an amazing opportunity for me to continue to live into the assignment that God put me on this earth for. And so I'm thankful for it. Um, I'm certain that it's going to have me doing work like this for people like people that live in Flint for a long time. And so I'm excited about the work. But again, I'm not chasing the bag. And so you don't get to use that as a carrot for me. I'm chasing the assignment. And I think the better I do, the better I am at chasing the assignment, then the bag happens. And that's the story that you tell to folks in high school that are trying to figure out their next steps or folks in in middle school that are trying to think about the options for career or even those folks in college that have decided on one thing and aren't sure chase the assignment don't chase the bag 
Because at some point, the folks are going to value what you put in. And when you're putting it in with closer proximity, with closer understanding of not only the community you serve, but who you are in doing and offering that service, um, you'll be rewarded. And if not rewarded here, rewarded in heaven. Look, that'll preach too. Um, so that uh, that's been my mindset. That's been my approach to the work. But again, Sean Hart drops jewels and I love using them. That's awesome. I appreciate you sh shouting him out. Um, because there's so many gems that come from community. Like, I mean, I get like my greatest awareness sometimes from just listening to one little thing dropped in a conversation. And I'm like, man, that's what I needed to hear. Um, for, for our partners and allies in the work that maybe have not had the same lived experience and community experience that we've had that um, are trying to figure out how to be more proximate and get closer to the issues and understand um, some of the, the gaps and things that we grew up in and that we did know before we knew the Community Foundation, what advice do you have uh, to them? Oh, man. So one, for anyone who's saying, eh, that Isaiah approach to the work, we don't want it, then just uh, obviously hit mute now because I, I'm not going to offer anything great. But if, if you believe that you need a Shonda in your organization, you believe that you need an Isaiah type personality in your organization and not just as president and CEO, but at any role in the organization, it exists. Go and get it. Point blank period. It exists. It exists in Minneapolis. It exists in San Francisco. It exists in Washington, D.C. It exists in Houston. It exists in Saginaw, Michigan. It exists. That community expertise, that community proximity exists, but you have to go get it and you have to be unapologetic about shaping your process whether that be a hiring process or an engagement of volunteer process or whatever process you're going to, you have to be willing to shape that process to get what you want. If you want community proximity, you might not be able to say, I need a bachelor's degree and 10 years experience. And I need a person who understands philanthropy or a person who understands grant making or nonprofits. Or, I mean, you might have to say, you know what, I'm going to strip all of this doubt. I'm going to get a broad pool of folks and I'm going to be very um, clear on what I want. I want com community proximity, folks who under understand marginalized populations, who live in areas with high concentrations of poverty, who are connected to the issues directly. You might have to say that in the job description to get what you want. But again, I tell you, I can almost promise you, as long as there's a middle class, a very higher class, and those folks who are marginalized the most, that that experience and expertise exists. But you have to be unapologetic about going to get it. Yeah, and I guess what I what I also hear in that and where I think I was asking and framing the question around is not necessarily where you where you answered it, which I appreciate. And that is the number of people that will call me or say, I'm trying to understand the issue better. I want to get more, more proximate. And so they see it as themselves. So what what I'm hearing now is basically stop centering, centering yourself as the one that has to be proximate and surround yourself by proximate people. Oh, yeah. Therefore, you will learn and grow and have what you need, because no matter how much you want it, you'll never have more than the people that have lived it. Is that what I heard? Oh man, so so yes, and if I was answering that question the way you intended, I would say fill your gaps. But that requires that you know who you are, and you know what you bring, and you know what you're capable of, and you're not capable of having my lived experiences. You're not capable, I've lived, I've lived my lived experiences and my journey is my journey, and your journey is yours. And so you can go back 39 years to try to live my life, which is probably not possible to go back and live someone else's life. So why not just pull me on board and allow me to fill the gaps appropriately? But it also, it requires that leaders know who they are and know what they bring and understand their gaps. Um, some people call it emotional intelligence. I don't know what to call it. I'm just saying, know, who, know you. Yeah, some emotional and social intelligence never hurt nobody. <laughs> so do you think philanthropy is doing a good job in pulling in community experts and listening? I think we've got a lot of work to do, but I will say we have made a huge, I'm going to say huge, we've made a pivot to understanding it's a necessity. Um, but now people are trying to figure out how to operationalize it. And I think that becomes one of the, one of the issues is because we want to create these processes that are equitable. And in sometimes, some, in some cases, we get so excited about creating equitable processes that the goal becomes creating an equitable process as opposed to creating equity. And yeah. so um, I think we've realized that we need it and we're trying to figure out how to operationalize it. Um, and time is of the essence. And sometimes you've got to, uh, you've got to, 
I don't want to say you got to skip the process, make sure you take notes when you do that. But sometimes you got to skip the process and get what you need and then write it down afterwards. And I, I would just encourage people to really get what it is they need to move and make the pivots a little quicker. Obviously, I talked about pace earlier. So you got to figure out what pace works for more people than just yourself. But um, I think we get enamored with process and equitable process and sometimes lose sight of the goal on the other end of equitable process is really having equitable solutions. Yeah. What are what are some tangible ways, if you don't mind sharing, that you build community voice into how you do grant making at your community foundation? Oh, man. So we have over 440 volunteers. Uh, we've made a decision to um, to empower our volunteers to make decisions that are ultimately ratified by our board as opposed to them coming to it. And we've, we've codified that in the language, we've codified that in our bylaws and our grant making processes and policies. And so, I mean, it's a little bit different than others and some folks aren't comfortable with it, right? They don't understand what ratification of those things means. But we've made a conscious decision that if we're bringing you in and giving you some cookies or quite frankly on Zoom these days, but engaging you to help us make decisions on behalf of community, we've got to empower you to make those decisions. And so when our board is looking at that, they're not looking to see if it was a good idea. They're looking to see, did we go through the due diligence process? Did we ensure that it was a charitable organization and a charitable cause, right? But we've empowered our volunteer groups, our geographic affiliate groups to actually make decisions on grants that matter in their community. And that's a way of not only amplifying voice, but sharing power. I, I, I live by this idea that there's only so much power. We're not gonna increase the amount of power. If 100% power is what it is, somebody's gotta give up power in order for someone else to have it. You can't just say there's more power available. We're not creating new power right now. And so how do we make sure people have, Tanya Allen, who all you all just, just received, and we um, I'm excited for you all in that. She has this thing where she says, um, we know the opposite of advantage or the opposite of disadvantage is advantage or privilege. So what, advantages, special advantages or privileges are we willing to offer to marginalized populations? And I think she said black people in this moment at this time. And right now, one of those things is not sharing power, it's giving power. How do we give the power that we have today to folks who don't have it? That way they can actually be part of the decision-making process. And for me, that's, that's part of amplifying the resident voices and showing that they matter. Um, giving them wing back chairs and not fold out chairs where they get to come for a minute. And then when they leave, we fold it up and lay it up against the wall. No, you get to sit here. You get to be here in your in your opinions about what we do as an organization matters and is codified in the language. We put it in the, the bylaws. We put it in the policy. Yeah. Um, Tanya Allen coming in as the president and CEO of the McKnight Foundation. I think she might shake some stuff up. If you're thinking, I'm, I'm almost assuring that that's going to happen. She has been an amazing advocate for those who have less in the state of Michigan, unapologetic about that. And, and I'm looking forward to what she's going to be able to do at the McKnight Foundation. Um, she deserves the stage. And man, are we excited as Michiganders to have that actually um, going to you all in Minneapolis to kind of share the wealth. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited about her coming too. As we, as we get ready to close, I want to... Um, just ask you, is there anything that um, I haven't asked that you would like to share? No, I just, I would, I would just say thank you for allowing me to share in the platform with you. You've created an amazing platform. You've, um, you've leveraged the social capital that you have and that the Minneapolis Community Foundation has to actually get messages out and word out. I'll listen to a few of the podcasts to prepare for today and you all are doing amazing work and you are doing amazing work. And so um, just thank you for allowing me to be here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And, um, you know, one of my measures of success are, you know, am I adding, am I adding something that wasn't there before? And I feel like I've been additive to the space um, in this time of racial reckoning, which we talked some about, um, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm in that pause phase, right? Like I, not so much pause, but this idea of let me, you know, I say this often, let me get to the balcony, let me, let me think, let me recalibrate, let me um, manage the emotion around the work that's driving the action in a time that I think bold leadership is required. And I appreciate the boldness that you bring and the authenticity that you bring into the work. Um, I look forward to running it into you when we can meet again at one of our national spaces. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, 2020 brings a level of boldness and joy and peace that uh, we all need and deserve. 
I'll think. And there you have it. That's Isaiah Oliver and Shonda Smith-Baker. Please visit conversationswithshonda.org to learn more. And follow Shonda on Twitter or Instagram at Shonda S. Baker. This is Sue Pak Kienitz from the Minneapolis Foundation. Thank you for listening to Conversations with Shonda.